Hey there, Knicks fans. Damn right. I got some energy today. I'm finding the reserves somehow. I'm finding the reserves. Um, it's your boy, Jonathan Macri with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast as we continue to inundate you with content. You know why? Because it's goddamn playoffs and nothing is promised in life, even though it seems like this has become a regular thing for the Knicks. Um, so damn right, we're going to enjoy it and enjoy it to the fullest extent that we we possibly can, especially after a game one win. And I'm very excited to talk to uh, my friend and co-host about said victory. I actually, I don't know where he was for this win. And I'm going to find out right now. Jeremy Cohen. Hello, sir. Hello, John. I was at T squared. You were. Oh, I wasn't party. sure. Yes, I was there. Oh, I was there with yeah. Andrew and okay. XJ and everyone else who was able to join us for the event. We had a fantastic time. Of course, it helps that the Knicks won. I actually got a text from my mom after it happened. She said, you know, watch the last 15 minutes of the game. So exciting. Uh, glad that they finally won when you had a watch party. And I was like, what? Why? Like, mom, what the hell? So it are was we, funny, but it was, it was like, are we undefeated I, one, for playoff? They're watch two parties? and oh, yeah, yeah, two and oh yeah. in watch parties. As far as I know, I mean, we did game one last year for yeah. the Cavs series and game one here. So clearly something's working rather win in the playoffs than not in the yeah. regular season. So, but we had a really great time. It was, it's an awesome venue doing more stuff there in the near future. Yes. And uh, it was great to watch with people who are like-minded and enjoying a Knicks victory. Um, I'm sure it was really cool to be there as I, and I'm happy you were there because I think your energy is the right type of energy for that sort of event. Andrew's energy, right type of energy for that event. Uh, I believe XJ was there, right? And yes, he was. A- anyone else from the casual crew? That was it. Mensa was, okay. was at the game. Oh, Mensa's right. Mensa was at the game. I saw that. Sean was unable to join. But I, I, you know, actually, again, the right type of energy, I think, for for that sort of event. Although I, I know it gets under skin, uh, actually, skin whenever, you know, Josh Josh Hart is left wide open and, you know. And hits him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Actually, so, fun story. Uh, when Josh Hart hit that first three in the first quarter, I was near XJ. And I made sure to get into his line of sight and I pointed at him. Just like a like, he's hitting them. Like <laughs> yeah, start. It's getting hot. Don't let them get hot. And you know, it's it's a fun outcome. Yeah. Um. But I my my long story short, my energy would not have been the right energy <laughs> for, that, <laughs> for that sort of affair. Um. I didn't really talk about this on the post game last night because I wanted to focus the attention on on the game and and the heroes of the game and and God knows there were there were many. Um, I'm not gonna say it was a nervous wreck, to, like for the entire day. I mostly tried to avoid thinking about the game. Like I wasn't on social media at all. I I sent out one tweet about how if they lost this game, it was basically going to be their death sentence because of. Uh, both the Knicks' recent history in terms of like game ones deciding the outcome of series. Um, someone re- someone replied actually to that tweet and said the Knicks have never won a series in which they lost game one at home. Uh, last season, I-, I think I mentioned this on the live stream. You know, t- teams that won game one were twelve and three, and even that's a misnomer because of the Kawhi injury. So like, I was just very and I you know the little bit that I did engage over the few days leading up to the playoffs. I felt like, and I knew there was a lot of people picking the Knicks, but I felt like every, and this is just, this is the PTSD talking. All of this is the PTSD talking. As you know, you, you're by, yes, I'm silently nodding. Just like, yes, dear. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Go on. I want, I wish I had, uh, like there was a graphic that displayed on the screen. I don't know if, uh, like advanced, like metrics are to this point, but a, a meter that displayed on the screen which showed your internal judgment on it, like from a scale of like one to a hundred, just whenever I say whatever the fuck nonsense comes out of my mouth. And I, I like, I'm, I'm curious when are the times where it would hit into like the eighties, maybe get into the nineties. I'm just, that would fascinate me. And I would, you know, you know, it'd have to be like hooking me up to a machine, like it measures my pulse. And then when it's off the charts, it just kind of converts into a number. 
There's some sort of amount that tells us. Well, I mean, us, they have like, a lie detector test. There's no yeah, reason we can't come up with this. But neither of us is lying about anything. Like, no, it's, no, it's yeah. just about measuring emotion. So. Where, where is society at that we don't have a judgment <laughs> a judgment meter test, whatever, that we can hook people up to? Oh, man, we've I, I need to get some sleep. Um, anyway, uh, I felt... Here's what I was going to say. I felt like the people that I listened to that picked the Knicks almost picked the Knicks like because they felt like they had to because they felt like they were giving this team the respect that it was due you know based on their season long body of work but it, inherent in that is like the reason they're giving them the respect is because they've earned it and it's all the things that we have been talking about for weeks and months about how like they they deserve to be considered a contender based on everything that they've done or, or at the very least like a, a threat slash favorite to get to the conference finals and yet the people that I would listen to where I felt like they were picking Philly were like, yeah, I, I really want to pick the Knicks, but man, this is, this is Joel Embiid. This is Tyrese Maxey. This is, this is the Sixers. This is the team that was doing X, Y, and Z before Embiid got hurt. And, and as I was going right up until like, as we got closer and closer to game time, I was like, shit, if Embiid's just magically Embiid again, where, you know, where does that leave us? And then the game started. And I'll be damned if within the first five minutes, Joel Embiid did not look like capital J, capital E, Joel Embiid. Um, and so I would like, I would right at like a, maybe the five, six minute mark of the first quarter, I would not have been the best person to be around in a public setting. I will just say that. It's fair. You know, game starts. We're all excited, eager to see playoff basketball first time in a year. And like, 16 other fan bases or 15 other fan bases, I should say. And Joel Embiid comes out hot from the start. And my sinking suspicion is this doesn't look like uh 60 or 70%. And if it is, that's pretty terrifying because uh, he looked great. Yeah. But my thought process, and I believe we even talked about it on the pod was let Embiid have his close off the water on the other teammates around him because he's going to be a superstar. Let the superstar do superstar things. But if you prevent, you know, those open threes, the closeouts, anything that sure. might cause a leak, then you're in better hands. But then of course they're up double digits in the first quarter and Embiid looks great. And you're thinking, well, how are you going to stop this? And obviously the topsy turvy nature of, losing a quarter, then winning a quarter, then losing a quarter and winning a quarter. And uh, it was chaotic. I yeah. just, the only thought that I had was, well, if they lose, we're in good company at least. And yeah. there's a fully stocked bar here. <laughs> and also <laughs> you have to lose, attitude. you have to lose two to win in six. So uh, it, but fortunately we didn't have to get to any of that because yeah. they, they figured out, what I thought the Sixers did a great job of, of course, was they cut the head off of the snake in Jalen Brunson and it kind of did. I wouldn't say deteriorated, but they, their game plan was succinct. They, they got exactly what they were going for and it didn't even matter because the Knicks found talent in their talent. Who's been there at various points all year. I mean, obviously the story goes to Deuce McBride. It just full stop. I, so do, it should be. I, I, it has I, to be. And I got this wrong uh, on the post game. And I'm, I'm, I usually feel like I'm, I'm pretty good about getting stuff right in the moment after the game ended. I called it. Oh, this is going to be the Josh Hart game. But let's let's pay respect to the two guys that we know Knicks fans are going to gravitate towards because I, I think it was in the moment it was coming off all those threes where it felt like mm -hmm. he had six threes in the last you know five minutes of the game. But no, it's it's. It's the Deuce game. You're a hundred percent. It's the Deuce McBride game. It has to be because he's the only player when I thought he was in the game, I felt a level of confidence that I just didn't have from anyone else. Like the yeah. other player I would add to that is Mitchell Robinson. Mitchell Robinson. Yeah. Because just, um, and it's, it's funny too, how I went into this series thinking, well, Hartenstein of course has been fantastic all year. Sixth in defensive EPM amongst qualifying players, truly fantastic. And I just felt, you know, Mitch, you get someone like Embiid who's spacing the floor a little bit more, stretching it. Like, is he going to be great when he's not quite? And, and obviously, we all know from watching him that he was second, and a second, I should say. Well, the key, had he stayed healthy, 
I believe he would he was on the path for an all oh. defensive nod. This was a bold prediction that I had in the beginning of the season. Oh, Mitch, you're talking about it. Mitch, yeah, Mitch. Sorry, yes. Yes, and yes, it yes, was Mitch. looking like it was coming correct. And of course, he gets hurt and everything. But his ability to lock into Embiid, that's like the level of confidence. Whereas, you know, Hartenstein, it's not his game. Get Embiid, get Mitch in there to guard Embiid. But to go back to the deuce point, because he was the first person where it was like in the third quarter when things started to go awry once again. I was just thinking like this, this is the guy who needs to be in there. It's not Josh Hart. Of course, kudos to Tibbs for sticking with Hart because it paid off in the fourth quarter. But so we can you know talk about this and that and whatever. It, it all added up in some to the next winning. But to shift back, it was... The reason it was the deuce game was because he's the only player who I felt was not prepared because everyone was seemingly prepared, but the only one who was delivering at such a high level, especially in transition uh, on the catch and shoot, just the ability to be that guy that the Knicks sorely needed Brunson to be. And he was not. And um, the, just incredible performance from 36 pick overall. You can find talent anywhere in the draft. What was Mitch? 35? Uh, no, he's not 35. Well, you look at all. I should know this. I, no, I should know it too. I use it. He was somewhere in there. Thirty because Brunson was, was 30. 30s. There are 36. Kevin's telling us. So they okay, were both perfect. the 36 pick of the draft. Oh, Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Cause uh, Rokas was 34th after was the next four. Right, they traded 32 to go. Yeah. To go down. Yep. Um, Thank you, Kev. Thanks, Kev. Uh, so, you know, you just, I don't know if you meant to, to, to touch on this cause I was going to bring something up and I, I, I it's almost sacrilegious to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, and hopefully nobody gets too angry at me or not any more angry than they usually would get at me. Um, is it crazy to say that maybe the Knicks were a little tight? That not all the Knicks, because obviously Deuce of Pride is the opposite of tight. Mitchell Robinson, opposite of tight. Uh, Boyan McDonavich, who, by the way, has been through some wars in Utah before. Um, not a ton, but enough. Uh, was Was not tight. And Josh McBride, or Josh McBride, my God, <laughs> again, need that sleep. Uh, Josh Hart, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't define him as tight, but let's just say maybe it took him a little while to fully loosen up. So, but the, I think the guys that, if I was to give my rankings of like, who were the most vital players for the Knicks offense, Brad Bronson's obviously number one, and then I think number two and three in some order would have been DiVincenzo and Hardenstein. And it, it's it's interesting because I went back and I was rewatching from the start of the game and it was like the second or third possession. Hardenstein gets wide open, like the most open he's ever been in his life from floor to range. I think Kyle Lowry was in between mm-hmm. him and the, and the rim. And it just, it rimmed out. Now, it's it, it was like it, almost down, whatever. And then next possession, um, Dante DiVincenzo. Similar opportunity. Floater missed. And then so I'm watching these and I'm continuing to watch and it's not and I'm like, man, it wasn't just Brunson missing a lot of these short mid rangers, a lot of them. And I went out, went and looked. So for anybody just a quick aside, the Knicks have lived on short mid rangers all year. It's by design. Mm-hmm. Um, this is how they've structured their offense. They intentionally not intentionally don't get all the way to the rim, but like it's it, it, they know they're not getting all the way to the rim. It's like we, we, these are the shots we're going to take. We're comfortable taking these shots. They're top ten in frequency. They're top ten in accuracy of these shots, um, and it, it allows them to get a lot of offensive rebounds, which I'll get back to in a second. But so I looked it up, and, and thank goodness for cleaning the glass. Who keeps track of this stuff? Do you want to know during the regular season? Just take a take a wild guess. Uh, what their lowest uh, hit rate was, lowest rate of accuracy for shots in the short mid range was in a single game. And I will, I will tell you that um, for the year they were in terms of accuracy of those shots, they hit them at a 45% clip. So what do you think the worst they did in w- w- was in any game this season? I'll go 23%. Yeah. You, did you look that? No, we no, I didn't. I swear. No, time. I did not. I did not look this up. It was a wild guess. I just took it basically in half and rounded. You were, up. You were damn close. It's twenty one point one percent. Okay. Do you want to take a wager as to what their percentage was in the short mid range in this game? I'll say seventeen percent. Fourteen point eight. 
Um, they were they attempted from the short mid range in this game, twenty seven shots. They hit four of them, and this is their bread and butter. This is like what they want to do, and it's nothing. I mean, it was just nothing. Like I went and looked at the shot chart. I think Brunson hit a couple of them. I think Bogey actually hit one. The one where um he backed down whoever he. Or maybe he drew a foul on that one. One of his one of his uh, buckets was from that range, and I forget who the other one was. But like, I I don't I, I think that like th- this is gonna go up because it can't get worse. And I just think that maybe like just again coming out of the gate, some of the guys who like knew like okay, Julius is not here right now. Jalen Brunson's like the number one, but you know maybe uh, maybe it's up to me to be the number two tonight or the number three or whatever. And some guys just maybe weren't as comfortable. Um. So, but at the same time, I don't know how much to put on that because how many of those short mid range misses led directly to offensive rebounds and New York got 23 offensive boards, which was, um, I forget, I put it in the newsletter today. It's one, it's one of the highest totals in, in their, their history. So, I mean, I guess if everything works out, um, I don't, I don't know what, what made me think of this, but like, yeah, it was just a weird game. It was a weird, weird, weird game. But I think that's a fair assumption, not, or not assumption, a hypothesis in that kind of tight all around. And they found at least one player who was loose from the jump and that made a significant difference. Yeah. Because when you look at from a context standpoint from cleaning the glass in the half court, the Knicks were in the 11th percentile, which Sorry. is abysmal. And when you consider that Philadelphia was in the 74th percentile, you would look at those stats and think, how the hell did the Knicks come close in this game, let alone win it? And sure enough, it's because in transition, the Knicks were in the 100th percentile That's in uh, points per possession. And the Sixers were in the 63rd percentile. And that was enough of a difference. And mind you, the Sixers did great mm-hmm. off of steals as well. Um, it's off the live rebounds where the Knicks just really pushed it. And that's where the Sixers were pretty terrible and the Knicks were also in the 100th percentile. So it's it's that speed factor. Of course, a lot of it being leak outs where necessary. Mm. The Knicks also crushing the Sixers on the boards, being able to play, or at least winning that battle. Like, Did you see their offensive rebound percentage? <laughs> <laughs> it was over 50. It's That means the Knicks rebounded over half of their misses, yeah. which is like... If you put a pro basketball team on the floor with like an eighth grade group of of like children, you might get a 50 offensive rebound percentage. That's what the Knicks had yesterday. And so between that and between what you're talking about in transition, it balanced out the worst they've been from the short mid range all season. And one of the worst Brunson games shooting wise, at least that we've seen all season, certainly on volume. Like he's had some worse like percentage shooting wise in terms of his like shop, um, field goal percentage or effective field goal percentage. But on this much volume took 26 shots, made eight. Like it's, you can count him on one hand where he's been this bad. Yeah. And for those keeping track at home, the 50.9% offensive rebounding rate that John mentioned, that would also be hundredth percentile. So the Knicks maxed out in certain areas in such a way that won them this game, but it covered up for woeful performances across the board, but in areas where I feel confident about the Knicks and what's gotten them to the point of being the number two seed this season. And it's not to say, well, it's automatically going to be fixed game two. That was a fluke. And no, but it's, I feel more confident knowing that they've got one under their belt. They'll play their game it should come to them hopefully a little bit more easily. There will be adjustments made on both sides, of course, and there will be in-game adjustments that need to happen. But sticking to what also got you to this point, I think is a pretty crucial factor that will play well for the Knicks in game two. Yeah, I I completely agree. I think when you, when you, I did a version of this last night, so I'll I'll try to, um, but uh, like if you factor in everything that we just talked about, and then you also throw in the fact that like they were 16 of 26 on above the break threes. Like that's, that's just not going to happen right. again. That's a, that's a, that is another black swan event. Um, but then you factor in Brunson shooting and the, again, the short mid range and all, and you put it all into the pot. I feel like, like it, it all, it's all going to kind of even out in the end with the exception of Brunson. And I think 
if like sometimes you, we make things more complicated than they need to be. Um, if, if Brunson has a, the rest of the series where he's close to what he was in this game, which is like a 33 effective field goal percentage, well, they're not going to win the series, I don't think, even though they have game one in their in, in their back pocket. Um, if he could get up into like the mid to high 40s, let alone into the 50s with all the attention that he's getting and stick with the volume that he's on. And that's the key, right? Is like the Knicks need him. Like I saw some comments. Um, you know, not not criticizing him or anything, but like, you know, Brunson could get off the ball more. He, you know, we forced some shots. And I don't disagree with that. I actually think when he when we got into the third quarter, again, going back, kind of rewatching, maybe he did force a couple, but like he needs to shoot. Like, I don't know that there's a world where the Knicks are winning games consistently in the postseason where he's not taking you know, at least 20 shots a game. And again, he took 26. So maybe a few too many, you figured the turnovers would go down. But I kind of, for me at this point, following game one, I'm, I'm okay. I'm pretty okay with where I feel like the Knicks defense is and where it will be moving forward. I'm my, my concern is more with making sure they, they or trying as best as they can to get Brunson I don't know what the word is. So more more comfortable. I mean, like the playoffs are uncomfortable, so I don't know if he's going to get more comfortable. But like, because it's not. I don't know that it's it's a matter of being like, well, you got to get him better shot opportunities. Because like that's that's. I don't know how much they can control that. You know, unless I'm I'm mistaken. No, I agree. And also talk about the ability to show up when you can't contribute positively. And this is what makes Brunson such a phenomenal player. Is oh, yeah. had seven rebounds, five yeah. offenses. Yep. Like doing the dirty work that got his teammates the ball. I just I always astounded, but he, they needed more from him and he wasn't able to deliver. And it's funny because I think back to the run that he had when Luca was out and it was just him. And for whatever reason in my mind, I just thought to myself, Oh yeah, he, he played a great game one and was just hot from the jump. And he didn't, I mean, they lost, that game and uh, it's 24 points on 24 shots. It was game two, the adjustments that he made where he had 41 points on 25 shots right. and game one last year, he, he played well. Uh, so it was 24 field goal attempts, 27 points. It, and then Cleveland. game two against Cleveland. And then game yeah. two, of course the Knicks were blown out, lost by 17 yeah. in Cleveland. Uh, it was a reverse 20 points on 17 attempts went five of 17 from the floor. And it took him a little bit of time to amp up. So I, I guess Miami the, the kind too, of arguably, right. I mean, cause he had yeah. a stride at the end of that series. He did. Yes. I, I would say, I mean, it was game two where he really shined. And of course that was a Nick win. <laughs> yeah. Nick's win. So I just think that he might be the type of player. It takes him a game to get his feet wet and sure. perhaps, but you know, last, Last year, game one, he for the against the Cavs, he did pretty okay. So uh, maybe there's no sample size to really take from this. Maybe uh, yeah. it's just a handful of games and you pick and choose. But I am confident that he can rebound, no pun intended. Yeah, be set for game two. No, I'm I'm like I, needless to say, nobody here is losing faith in Jalen Brunson. I, I think Benji nailed it when and Benji, by my lord, uh, he did a forty some odd uh, clip uh, tweet thread about game one and I think the thing that really nailed it for me at least was pinpointing how Tyrese Maxey Tyrese Maxey I mean you could say that Tyrese Maxey was the best player in game one I don't think you're going to get a a ton of argument considering that Joel Embiid had obviously a really good first quarter but then from there started to go downhill I'll get back to Mitchell Robinson in a bit um, and what he was able to do against Joel but like Maxi was not only awesome on offense, he was like defensively, I I think maybe, you know, as Benji put it, maybe Brunson underrated him a little bit as far as a one-on-one defender. Um, And, or maybe like it was one of those situations where you never know how guys are going to react where it's like, they're so surprised that they're getting the matchup that probably going into the game, they're like, well, if I could just get the Maxi matchup one-on-one, I'll be fine. And then he got it. And it's like, oh, okay. Um, and not that he didn't know what to do with it, but just like he was off. Like there, I thought there were shots that he missed that he usually makes. And it's as simple as that. Um, I think that's the key matchup. Cause I think he'll get that 
they'll get that switch again. Um, I don't know how easily they'll get it or how consistently they'll get it, but they'll they'll get it again. And then the other part of it is like the the heart piece because the <laughs> So this is the weird thing, and I'm curious how you're how you're reconciling this because I don't know that I have reconciled it yet. Like Josh Hart won in the game, right? He made three threes in the fourth quarter. He was awesome. I mean, and in in addition to all the stuff that he also does, which is why you have to have him on the floor to begin with. Like he's a he's a winning player, helps you win games. I if I'm Philly, if I'm Nick Nurse, and he kind of he essentially said this after the game. I'm not changing any of my coverage. Like I'm still leaving. Jo- I'm, I'm playing 15 feet off of Josh. I'm playing 20 feet off of Josh Hart. You know, um, because if like you'd rather Josh Hart, like if you go down with Josh Hart making four of eight threes in every one of these games, and that's how you go into your summer. All right, you tip your cap and you go home. Um, and I think he thinks that Hart's not. You know, and I think he'd rather just muck everything else up. So it's about how are you getting Hart involved in your actions if you're the Knicks um, or are you just going to have them keep, you know, there, there's to a, some extent, like they will, they will, they're going to keep telling him like, keep shooting it. And I'm sure he's going to put up a lot of threes in the series, but there also needs to be ways where he gets involved in the action, whether, you know, it's a, it's a dribble handoff or, you know, the, the, um, the horn set that Benji highlighted that led to the Ananobi three, where you're bringing two guys up, you know, simultaneously. So they can't really play off a heart. Like there's different things they could do. It's just a matter of like, well, let's, let's see what they actually choose to, to go forward with. So that that's the other main thing that I'm kind of watching for starting with, with game two. Yeah. I, I agree. If I'm Nick nurse, I know what their game plan is. In the sense of like, it's it's exactly how if the Knicks were, for example, matching up against Indiana, right? Like we know how the Knicks have covered someone like Miles Turner, where yeah. Miles Turner will have a hot yep. shooting night and everyone says, well, why are the Knicks switching coverage? Why, why are they letting him shoot and make these shots adjust? And it's, well, the numbers still say that it's yep. it's better to stick to the plan than it is to go out and change it up and leave other options on the table. And I just, I can understand why if you're Philly, you just kind of say, if we're going to lose this series because a sub uh, average three point shooter is connecting on shots that we're giving him to try to prevent other advantage opportunities from being created, then that's simply just how the series is going to go. And it's not going to break our way. Yeah, And a lot of it's going to have luck factored into it. But if you're, Philadelphia, you just have to stick to to the same way from the Knicks. You got to stick with what has gotten you here. And of course, that is with your scouting department being able to determine if Josh Hart is worth covering. And look, maybe Josh Hart has another stellar game too. And they adjust again, as they will naturally do, as they'll adjust for every single game and even in-game adjustments. But that's the type of player you live with because what other opportunities are presenting themselves if Josh Hart is there? Uh, like yeah, who I, else is on the floor with Josh Hart? Probably outside yeah. of a center, it's probably three shooters. So where are you loading up in a way that prevents them from getting theirs? It's it's that's the beauty of adding better spacing talent around this entire team and what the Knicks front office has been working towards since Leon Rose got here. Yeah, and like you know, it's easy to forget that Josh Hart. I'm not. Listen, as people know, I'm the biggest Josh Hart fan there is, but um, it is easy to forget that he he would not be in the starting lineup if Julius Randle was healthy. Like he'd be the guy that is is going to the bench. Like there's no way that Tibbs would be taking Divincenzo out of the starting five. Um, and you know, not that Randle's like the best shooter in the world, but obviously he brings a whole different set of concerns for a defense if you're trying to shut down the Knicks. So like that's where the Julius injury really comes into play here. Can they overcome it? Yes. But, you know, it's like, you know, I'm thinking like how, how the vibes are right now. I, if I was, if I was nurse, I, I would, I would be talking pretty, this is going to sound crazy. I think I'd be talking pretty confidently to my team right now. And again, that's going to sound nuts. The Knicks are up one Oh, and Joel Embiid is hobbled. But I'm just saying, if I was nurse, it might be a little bit of false bravado, but I'd be like, look, they had 16 of 26 above the break threes. They're never going to do that again. Um, Josh Hart made three big 
threes in the last five, six minutes of the game. That's not going to happen again. Um, and m- most urgently, and this is what the Sixers can control. They were out rebounded by uh, 20. The hell was the final number? I think it was 21 or 22. Some it's again, I looked it up um, before we came on. And I, of course I forget what I found, 22. but it, 22. That is one of the, like you'll go, we'll go the entire playoffs and we'll see another rebounding margin like that. Maybe a, not even a handful of times. Um, ironically, actually, Minnesota had a had a high rebounding margin yesterday against the Suns, but that's a that's a Suns issue. Um, like Philly is not good on the board. They're twenty fifth in the league, I think, on the defensive glass. So, like, this is not a strength of theirs. But I think they will go into Game Two and into the rest of the series, being like, "Look, that is the one thing that we have to do." Now, are they in complete control of that? No, of course they're not in complete control of that. Like the Knicks are. A, the best offensive rebounding team in the league. So just because the Sixers put their mind to getting defensive rebounds does not mean they are going to get defensive rebounds. But considering they could make it more of an area of, of active focus, I guess, they could go into game two and the rest of the series and be like, look, if instead of losing by 22 on the boards, we lose by 11 on the boards. Like, we win this game. Even with their hot shooting from above the break and 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 everything else. And then it just comes down to how sustainable do they think their game plan is against Jalen Brunson? And to a lesser extent, like will the, will, will other Knicks supporting cast members like step up and, and do what they have to do. And then of course there's the Embiid part of it all, but like, I don't know if you want to get into that now. Like I, I don't even know what there is to say about it, but well, yeah. I, um, before we go to Embiid, you're yeah, absolutely it, right. Cause that, the rebounding was going to be my main talking point. And Nick nurse said, he floated, you know, oh, maybe we'll have yeah, Reed and Paul Reed mm-hmm. and Embiid together. And maybe they do that, right? Maybe. Like that duo together, 97th percentile uh, together and cleaning the glass. You want to know how many possessions that consists of, though, John? This for this year? For this season. <laughs> Embiid and Reed are on the floor together. 50? How many times? 16. 16. There you go. 16. Okay. So I think that was more tongue in cheek and uh, more of a misdirection because to me, it's like if you really want to try that, sure, go for it. But it, it worked when you've done it, but the sample size is so small that you might as well not rely on it in such a way. And if it works, then perhaps you got lucky. Perhaps there's something there. But with your backs more against the wall, especially if you, uh, I mean, you obviously want to win four games, of course, but. Yeah. If you you have to steal one from Madison Square Garden, if you want to win this series, if you're Philly. So I, I agree that the rebounding, because also, as we talked about, the Knicks, their transition, what they did off of rebounds in terms of the opportunities they created were so crucial. And I mean, that was a lot of it, probably maybe more on the defensive side, especially if they're running up the court. But although that would be the transition, regardless, they they found a way to capitalize on those boards. So, yes, that if I'm Philly, I'm looking to shutting that down as much as I can, crashing boards, forcing them, getting more physical. Because I think the way that the Cavs last year were able to win that one game, if memory serves, I mean, they they felt that they got punched in the mouth. And then yeah. they regrouped. The difference, of course, is a key difference, is that the Knicks are home and the Sixers are not. It's not like the Knicks went to Philly and won this game. Now, if we want to talk about Joel Embiid, one thing that kind of surprised me, and this was probably by Philly's design as well, is I was hoping that when the Knicks see this star player who's already hobbled with a knee injury and goes down off of an incredible play, but it was. incredibly foolish, I thought, to like, you know, you're not quite yeah. there. Like, landing is a problem. So, Obviously, he comes back and played great. I'm really glad also that the Knicks won for so many reasons. But another was when they zoomed in on his brace and they saw what looked like to be a little bit of blood. Mm-hmm. I was having Kurt Schilling uh. sock flashbacks. <laughs> like, I I cannot have the Sixers win. And suddenly we're talking about the bloody brace. I just can't do it. I've already lived through blood soaking has a ring some to it. sort of... Ut- don't give a crap. It's done. It's in the past. It's not happening. It, it's it's neutral. Uh, it, it's it doesn't matter. So, 
But in terms of Embiid, I was surprised that the Knicks didn't get him more into open space, that they weren't running him more, exhausting him more to the point yeah. where like, he dropped back and he's an incredible rim protector. So he was staying more in his lane. Of course, it was harder for the Knicks to be able to attack because he's such an imposing threat there. But just I was hoping to see more switches where he has to be on the perimeter getting him moving a little bit more because what he was doing in the offensive act and was so much screening and he did great with the screening, uh, the shooting, he wasn't playing the game that was really interior um, that he's so fantastic at. And so just getting him, getting that cardio up, making him uncomfortable is something I wish I'd seen more from the Knicks and hope to see more from in game two. My, my only retort to that. And again, I'm just, not anything I could take credit for, but you know, again, Benji and and like DJ also in the clips that he shared did a great job of pointing out in the second half how like Embiid was Embiid was calling out switches actively from the post where it's like okay, whoever you know he he was guarding was like going out to the perimeter. Well, okay, well so and so you go over there and get this, and he would just hang back, which again works. If there is at least one player who the Sixers are comfortable leaving wide open behind the arc, which gets us back to Josh, Josh Hart. All, all roads lead back yeah. to Josh Hart. So it's either, again, A, Josh Hart's shooting, B, Josh Hart feels comfortable putting the ball on the floor and doing something with a, a runway, which I'll get back to in a second. C, Josh Hart gets involved in the action such that they cannot, uh, um, or his, his openness cannot hurt them, or D, Josh Hart's not on the court. Um, the thing that I, I'm, I'm at least a little more curious about or mildly curious about is other than deuce on that one drive, I think on the fourth quarter and, and maybe, I don't know if there was even another instance, maybe Brunson got him once Brunson got over, over Embiid once, but like, I didn't feel like any of New York's perimeter players challenged Embiid on drives. Now, maybe that's really smart because Joel Embiid is 300 freaking pounds and is like a defensive... Ha, ha, let's say this. Has all defense instincts at the very least, even if he does not have all defense physical, total physical presence right now, but I wonder even a compromised version of him, how much he'd be able to do. But again, I'm wondering because I don't know because the Knicks didn't challenge him. So that to me would be maybe the if the Sixers are just not, or are, are like, or he's not going to move out on the perimeter under any circumstances, and the Knicks are going to have the personnel they have on the floor, I think that's kind of the only pivot left to make. I, I mean, look, all the stuff we're talking about right now, you know that they're talking all about it. I guess the only question is like, are they brushing it off as like, listen, if Josh Hart's open, he's going to shoot the ball, and that's all there is to it. We're not. Like there is no need to discuss this. If he's open, he's going to shoot it. If he's not, and if he's not open, that means something else is open. And you know, and and I don't, I don't. We'll see how if that's the case. We'll see if if how far that gets them. Or I, I suspect they will mix some things up, and it's not going to be exactly a repeat of game one. Good. I don't know. I, I mean, just looking forward to the rest of the series. Like I, I think game two is going to be a freaking battle. Um, are you? Are you still are you fearful of the series? Because I I still am. You were, and, I mean, I not like look, again. I I still stand by this team winning in six games, and okay. if they're able to do it in shorter fashion, fantastic. If it takes them to seven, get out of the series. Okay. I don't even want to talk about the alternative. So uh, either way, I just uh, I, I'm not overly concerned because I expect Philly to steal a game it's just a matter of is stealing a, like does it constitute a stealing a game if they win on their own home court because that's where that's their home and yet they're the seventh seed so i i don't want to say i'm not worried you know if the knicks lost game one i oh. still felt like the sixers could have rested Embiid, given him a nice handful of days off because from their philosophy it could have been well look we we won one of them we did our job. Let's go home, protect it as opposed to like, let's go in for the kill. Yeah. But we don't have to worry about this scenario because they didn't. No, win no. Thanks. So I, you know, I fully expect and be to 
play game two. I, the Knicks certainly know what is at stake in that still want to protect home court. They're hopefully not as tight to your point and they're able to do a little bit more. I, I'm just, I'm not worried, but I'm not, you know, like it's, it's kind of just anything goes, which is not the best analysis, but it's, I, I'm, I just, I'm expecting Philly to make very good adjustments, but I'm confident with how Tibbs has also grown in his way, not just to make adjustments from game to game, but in game adjustments. Um, I, I will also say this. I, I thought that Tibbs, his challenges, his use of challenges were fantastic. Oh, yeah. And I was shocked that the Knicks were only going to have one timeout with, what was it, eight minutes and 41 oh, yeah. seconds to go. And yet they found a way. And of course, a huge reason for that. Mitchell Robinson, uh, who has become a free throw assassin recently. Yeah, it's nice to Four see. Four in him. a row now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It was wild. So it's, it's hard, but it's trick of square. Yeah, it's it's hard for me to be worried. I mean, if they if the Sixers won this game too, would I be shocked? Of course not. No, they're a great team, but the Knicks are in the position they're in for a reason. Uh, I'm with you. Um, I'm obviously very hopeful for game two. I think obviously I think the Knicks could win game two. Um, I would not. I don't think I'd be devastated if they lost game two, just because I am really confident the Knicks can and will steal at least a game in Philly. The only thing that would have me, I mean, look, you don't want to lose home court advantage. The whole like you fight to get home court advantage. You if you lose it, you lose it. And it's not ideal. Um, I want to. I want to see them start to figure some stuff out with Brunson. I just want to see Brunson get on some kind of a role, get in some kind of a group um, such that it could carry over for the rest of the series. And like, obviously in a perfect world, he goes out there in game two and he's, you know, 15 for uh, 23 from the field. And he scores 38 points in, in the next romp. Like that would be great. And they, and again, they certainly could, especially again, the, the thing that we're not really talking about, because we just don't have the information is if MB is compromised. Um, and how much does that change things? Um, so look, they're in a good position here. Um, they earned it. It was just, I mean, it was just a classic Knicks win. It's like, that's, I think my biggest takeaway. We, and we, let's, we could give out a game ball and then we, we could uh, make our announcements. But like, this was like such a Knicks win for this team, this season. This was the, just the Nixie used to have such a negative connotation. Now, when you say something, that was a Nixie win. It's like the most positive thing in the world, right? Cause it means they, all the all the all the verbs, right? They scratched and toothed and clawed. And what does it mean to, to, to tooth and like? Are, are people gnawing at things? Is that what happens out in the world? Probably, yeah. I mean, if you're Probably. clawing, you, you're getting some teeth. Actually, you're crawl, if you got it, clawing, you're gnawing. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. That's put that going all honey badger. It's gonna be it. What is that? Wisconsin, Wisconsin honey badger. Yeah, Wisconsin, Wisconsin has the badgers. Yes, um, but the honey badger is isn't that? Well, no, I'm thinking of. Uh, no, it might be a different Matthew. mascot. I don't know. Could be. Yeah, but you know, you know, this is it kind of dawned on me as you mentioned this when it came to home court advantage. Think about the last time the Knicks won a playoff series at home. Uh you put me on the spot. The last time the Knicks won a playoff series at home. Ooh, well, they didn't do it against Boston, so Oh, I mean, I don't to believe it was 99, 99. It was 99 against it. Oh, that's yeah. Game game six was against the Pacers. That's right. So if I'm Only the Knicks, five years, my God, right. If I'm the Knicks and uh, I there's I mean, the Knicks have not think about it. the Knicks have not won a playoff uh, series at home since before Deuce McBride was alive. So I would love for them. I mean, we all would, of course, but there's, there's almost a pride thing of exercising the demons of your past and creating this new history and a new chapter. Cause I was thinking about the Kings the other day and obviously they lost their out, but if they had made the playoffs, we could argue about, well, are they taking that next step? Where's it going to be? How's it going to happen? But it kind of just the thought of winning cures all to the point where I was like, you remember when the Kings were, just an abysmal franchise. And it took me a second to think, yeah, they were 
terrible, but they're not now. Or even the Timberwolves with how bad they were. And now they're firing on all cylinders. And so I would just love to see, and we all would, of course, love to see victories at home. But the Knicks have an opportunity if they defend home court and steal one in Philadelphia to do yeah. exactly that. And how great would that be? I'm Look, man, if they won this freaking series in five games, that would be phenomenal. I'd be just as happy if they won in seven games. I mean that. Uh, but we'll hope for the best. How about that? I hope, I hope you're right and not me because I predicted the Knicks in seven. Uh, let's give out a quick game ball before we get to announcements because we might as well. There's praise to go around. So uh, game ball, we usually give out to the best player of the week who has contributed the most to the team's victory for today. We're giving it out just to whoever we feel like awarding uh, from this game. Uh, Jeremy, I'll give it to you if you want to go first. Unless if you want to give it to me, I'll go first. Sure, I'll take it. Uh, you know, do some pride. Uh, you know, it is, this was the Deuce McBride game. He just, how he has ascended is awesome. And to the point of always kind of felt like with these second round picks, you know, show me something, we'll move on and, and hopefully it's for the best, but the odds are usually against these players and the scouting, the development, the coaching, but at the end of the day, the talent that Deuce McBride had that he was able to bring out to help win this game. They lose this game without him. We are doom and gloom. We are seeing online about fake two seed and all of these attributes yep. about a team that we know won 50 games and has been worth it and more. So for him to save the day, uh, mm. just uh, it belongs to him. It's an incredible performance. Um, well earned from Deuce. Uh, which means I get to go and, and give it to Mitch. Uh, so a couple numbers for Mitch is four blocks in game one that tied a playoff career high. He had four blocks against the Cavs um, in, but that was in game two. That was in the big loss. Uh, his seven offensive rebounds, second highest of his playoff career. And granted, his, his playoff career is, is short. We're talking about 12 games now, but still. Um Seven second to game uh, five against the Cavs when he had 11. Um, and then basketball reference does this nifty thing um, playoff uh, or rather just game score, which kind of factors in everything that you you do together. And uh, he had a game score in this of 14.4, uh, which is the uh, fourth highest um, of his career after game five and game six against Cleveland. And then I saved the best for last because even as much as he was dominating the Cavs um, in that series, he never did what he did the other night, which is have which was be plus twenty in a game. And Mitchell Robinson was a plus twenty in this game, and I think he earned every bit of that plus twenty. And if you go and look at his um, statistics from this year, and, and again, granted, dude only played thirty one games in the regular season. This would have been his second highest plus minus in any game this season, a plus 20. So it is not an overstatement to say that like playoffs or no playoffs, you could you could say this was the best game of Mitchell Robinson's season. And when you factor in the fact that it was a playoff game, you could say this was the big, biggest game of Mitch Robinson's career. And and to even be able to say that, to arguably be able to say that, um, or to arguably say that, is pretty incredible when you consider the guy's been here for six years. And um, it's been a long time coming for him to have a moment like this. And I'm really, and I know the Cavs series was a moment in, in totality, but I don't know that he ever had a moment like this against this level of competition, you know, against the reigning MVP. So happy to give my game ball to Mitchell Robinson. And uh, onwards we go. I'm very happy we don't have to make predictions anymore, by the way. because It's nice. We don't have to sweat it. We have enough stress going on as it is. Why make things more stressful? We, we don't. We don't need any more. St Speaking of stress, Indiana losing by uh, twenty at the moment. I just looked up. Damian like, Lillard still a good player. Yeah, when he wants, <laughs> when he wants to he run, wants he can. Be. Yeah. Um, also, uh, yeah. OG Ananobi, uh, negative plus minus. First time fraud. I'm sorry. Yeah. You can't do. You just cannot have that happen. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it but his regular season. <laughs> his regular season streak is still intact, which it is. If he continues to next season has a chance to be like the, the longest such streak and like 
a very, 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 very long time. You know okay. what? If, if they're yeah. winning games, just real quick, if they're winning games and having a negative plus minus, I'm okay with that too. He could have a negative plus minus for the rest of the playoffs as long as they keep winning. I don't think he'll care and I certainly wouldn't care. Um, all right. Some quick announcements. Let me pull up Andrew's message here. Okay. So we are going to have another watch party, KFS watch party for game four. That will be uh, next Sunday. That's going to be a T-squared social again. Um, so all the usual uh, accoutrements, like we'll have a, a, an area where we congregate and watch the game on the big screen, be a, a phenomenal environment. The next are obviously going to be away in that game or for that game, so or away in Philly. Um, so if you're someone that usually goes to the Garden and you want to meet up with uh, other Knicks fans who are watching the game, come to T-Squared Social again for the Knicks Film School watch party next Sunday. Um, there will also be... Um, like game watches or watch parties there for games two and three, um, as well as Thursday. There's a, a, a massive night in sports on Thursday. So just go to T Squared Social. We've, we've loved having them as uh, one of our sponsors for the show for these last several months. And uh, it's it's great sports bar. And um, we're, we're thrilled with them and to do things with them. Uh, second announcement, and this is uh, relates to me. So GMAC, Andrew Claudio, and DJ Zulo will be on the, they will at least be opening the post game for game two, uh, which as you listen to this will be tonight, Monday night, um, because I am going to the game. Um, so for anybody, you know, just again, full disclosure, a lot of times people put in early super chats before they see who the host is. So I will not be the host at the at the start of the show. I think the plan is for me to come on to that uh, live stream at some point. So don't don't count me out just yet. Um, although I, um, I, I that's ultimately going to be up to Andrew Claudio and I, I guess we'll play it by ear. See by the time I get back from the game, see what the uh, what the what the mood is in here. But I'm gonna. I my plan is to is to hop on certainly. Um, and then the last thing, and uh, because I'm going to the game and uh, looking to just grab a drink someplace close to the to the garden, um, I'm gonna be going to head to Pen Six for just you know maybe a quick beer uh, before tip off on uh, Monday. So if anybody's going to the game, this is not like an official KFS event, but just if, you know, if everybody wants to grab a drink and say, hi, I will be at Penn six on 30 uh, first street and uh, just off seventh Avenue. And as my daughter's is coming to say hi. So that is my cue to leave. So yeah, come, come by, say hi, uh, grab a drink and uh, we could all head over to watch. Uh, hopefully the Knicks go up two Oh, together hi and that's it that's all i have to say because my daughter is just inserting herself into the podcast jeremy anything else from you i'll be a game for uh not at the game but at uh, t squared social come by we had a really great turnout as mentioned i expect an even larger turnout considering that people who would have gone to the event uh, went to the game instead so let's do it let's all hang out have a great time and uh, yeah, happy Passover to everyone celebrating. Sorry happy that you've Passover. got to deal with uh, the Knicks and the Rangers playing on back to back nights. Not fun. I'll still be watching, but uh, <laughs> that's just me. I'm a crazy person. You're not a crazy person. No, I'm actually skipping uh, a Seder to watch the Knicks and honestly would do it 11 times out of 10. So listen, it's just that. There's a, if there's a God above, he'll forgive you or she'll forgive you, whoever the hell they are. <laughs> the, uh, okay. The Knicks, there's no way. <laughs> the Knicks are Jewish, John, just to be clear. <laughs> We've been the wandering in the desert. Yeah, thousand percent, a hundred percent. No, a thousand. I, I mean, Ned Irish, definitely a Jewish name, hundred percent. That's Father Knickerbocker. <laughs> there was a yarmulke under that hat that he's wearing. <laughs> Andrew's gonna cut all this out, isn't he? No, he's not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, uh, he was he was Jewish. Uh, okay, now we're done. Before we get to the JFK jokes. My daughter's he was not Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> we need to end the pod right now. Okay. Uh, bye, everybody. We'll talk to you later. Peace out. <laughs>